considering the levels of organization that are relevant to the human body, we want to start with the chemical level of organization, which would be the lowest or simplest level from which everything else is composed. The reason why talking about electronegativity is so important is because it really does establish how certain elements interact together to form bonds, to connect together and be part of compounds and molecules. And so we want to sort of step up how we're talking about the chemical level of organization from the elements and atoms individually to how they interact together. And in talking about the bonds between atoms, we want to basically consider three types, what are called ionic bonds, covalent bonds, and hydrogen bonds. Ionic bonds are when atoms interact because opposite charges are attracted to each other. When I described the electron shells earlier and I showed you the image with neon, I described sodium being the next, electron, uh, next atomic number in the periodic table, it would have one more electron and therefore it would have to move out to another um, electron shell to fit that electron. That single electron in its orbit all by itself isn't the most stable uh, system for an atom, so that single electron can be lost quite easily. Uh, it, the affinity that the atom has for electrons can be pretty weak acting on that one, and so that one electron can be lost, so to speak. If we think about the atom is on the other side of the periodic table, so sodium is in the first group. If we go out to the seventh group, the one that has fluorine at the top, chlorine, which is below that, is on the same period as sodium, so it's going to have three electron shells. But its outermost valence shell is going to be filled almost to capacity with seven electrons. It wants one more electron to uh, completely fill that valence shell. Also, being right next to fluorine, chlorine is going to have a very high affinity for electrons, a high electronegativity. So that lone electron in the sodium atom can be pulled completely out of the um, valence shell of sodium and fill the valence shell of chlorine, chlorine making both of those electron electrically charged. Sodium, having one less electron than proton, would have a positive charge. Chloride, having one more electron than proton, would have a negative charge. And in fact, when we refer to cl the chlorine atom and its charged state, we usually refer to it as chloride. Um, now, sodium with a positive one charge and chloride with a negative one charge are going to have equal and opposite charges that will attract each other and they'll come together to make an ionic bond. Oftentimes with ions like this, ionic bonding like this, uh, we'll see many uh, atoms of those two elements come together and they'll form a lattice or crystal structure um, where all of the atoms are kind of attracted to each other uh, by their opposite charges, and the box that you see at the bottom in this picture represents a sodium chloride lattice, uh, or crystal. Now sodium chloride is what we can often refer to as table salt, and so that would represent a, uh, the kind of structure a crystal of salt would have. Now, as far as the scale is concerned, it's very small. Uh, if you were looking at a crystal of salt with your naked eye, you would not see it being four atoms high and four atoms wide and eight atoms, six atoms uh, long. That scale would be huge. It would be billions of atoms if it were large enough for you to see with your naked eye, but that represents its essential feature. Um, ionic bonds don't just have to be something simple like sodium chloride table salt, but <clears throat> we see that quite a bit. And it's usually when there are two elements from sort of complete opposite sides of the um, periodic table that they come together because of 
the idea that a single atom, uh, sorry, a single electron can be lost from one and gained by the other. The electrons are completely swapped from one to the other, and the result is the two atoms are going to have a completely full valent shell. For sodium, it loses a shell, so its next shell in is full, and chloride, by picking up that electron, fills its outermost shell. And so they both have stable valent shells in that configuration. Covalent bonds are probably the most common bonds that we'll be considering and the most stable. What happens in a covalent bond is two atoms share a pair of electrons. So uh, they're both looking to fill their valent shell, and in doing that, uh, <coughs> the shared electrons spend some time with both atoms giving them both a chance to complete their valent shells. There's two types of covalent bonds, and it depends on how that pair of electrons is shared. Nonpolar covalent bonds are when the pair of electrons that are shared are shared equally between the two atoms. The electrons orbit around one atom and orbit around the other atom, maybe like a planet in a binary star system to expand the planetary model that we've been working with. The reason why there's an equal sharing of electrons is that there's no greater electron affinity for one atom or the other, or the electronegativity is effectively the same. In the two examples represented here, hydrogen gas, H2, and oxygen gas, O2, since it's a diatomic molecule, the two atoms necessarily have the same electronegativity score. So an atom is equally attracted to both atoms in the pair. Also in this example, just to extend covalent bonding in general, notice that the oxygen gas molecule there is actually sharing two pairs of electrons. Oxygen is going to have six electrons in its valence shell, and so when two oxygens come together, they both are looking to pick up two more electrons. So by sharing two pairs of electrons, that means that both of them have effectively eight electrons in the valence shell. Now, another example, example of nonpolar bonding comes between two atoms that have equal or very close to the same electronegativity. The most common example that we'll see in the molecules that we deal with in anatomy and physiology are hydrocarbon bonds, or when hydrogen and carbon come together. If you go back and look at the periodic tables of the elements earlier, you'd notice that hydrogen and carbon have close to the same electronegativity. There's no significantly greater affinity of one atom for the electrons versus the other. So in a hydrocarbon bond, the pair of electrons is shared equally and therefore is nonpolar. In polar covalent bonding, what's happening is the pair of electrons are shared unequally, which is to say that the electrons are spending more time around one atom than the other. The quintessential example of that is the water molecule. When oxygen and hydrogen bond together, which happens twice in a water molecule, so each bond individually is a polar covalent bond, the one electron from hydrogen is shared with oxygen, and then uh, oxygen is sharing one of its electrons with hydrogen. For hydrogen, that means that there will be two electrons in its valence shell, which for that shell will be perfect, it'll be full. For oxygen, that electron will contribute to it filling its valence shell, and it's going to need another one in another bond. The thing is, is that the hydrogen nucleus is just a single proton, whereas the oxygen nucleus is eight protons, as well as eight elect, uh, neutrons. But the, as far as charge is concerned, we only care about the protons. The distance from the nucleus is slightly greater in oxygen, but not 
a whole uh, contributing factor. So the electronegativity for oxygen is significantly greater than that for hydrogen. The electrons are going to tend to be attracted to oxygen more. Uh, not enough to completely strip the electron off of hydrogen, so it's not going to become a hydrogen ion, but that hydrogen atom won't have electrons around it very much at all. When we talk about a polar covalent bond, we describe the bond as having a distribution of charge. There's going to be a partial positive charge on one side and a partial negative charge on the opposite side. The indication for partial charge is a lowercase delta, what looks like a upside down G, if you will, uh, which we see next to the hydrogen, a partial positive charge or a weakly positive charge. And next to the oxygen, we see two representations of the weakly negative charge, a partial negative charge, giving it the polarity across both of its bonds. Now, I want to jump back for a second to the list of the elements, and I want to remind you that the four most common elements in the body are oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. If we rearrange those four elements into this pattern, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon, which you can remember easily by the mnemonic HONC, H-O-N-C, this will give us a little bit of useful information to uh, make of those four major elements. Hydrogen has one electron in its outer shell, which can have potentially a total of two. Oxygen has six electrons in its outer valence shell out of a possible eight. Nitrogen has five out of eight, and carbon has four out of eight, which means hydrogen can make one bond with another atom. Oxygen can make two, nitrogen can make three, and carbon can make four, each of which will provide an electron to contribute to filling the valence shell of that element's atoms. Honk and HONC, mnemonic for the four major elements involved in the human body, and in that particular order also will remind you of how many bonds are possible for each. Coming back to the idea of nonpolar and polar bonds, and considering just those four major elements, it's easy to remember what bonds are polar and which bonds are nonpolar. You don't have to consult looking at electronegativities. The nonpolar bonds that we're going to deal with are primarily hydrocarbon bonds. When carbon and hydrogen make a bond, they're going to be nonpolar. And then any diatomic bond when oxygen bonds to itself, when nitrogen bonds to itself, when, when carbon bonds to itself. I don't have listed here hydrogen binding to itself because since hydrogen can only make one bond, diatomic hydrogen is necessarily hydrogen gas, which isn't really a very crucial part of the physiology in the human body. And then for the polar bonds, you can remember this always. Oxygen bound to hydrogen is polar. Oxygen bound to carbon is polar. Nitrogen bound to hydrogen, oxygen bound to nitrogen, those are polar also, although they're kind of weakly polar. Uh, we still consider them polar, but I just wanted to make that slight exception to understand that there's a little bit less polarity in those, but they're going to behave, as far as we're concerned, like the other polar bonds that we deal with. The third type of bond that we want to consider is the hydrogen bond, and this is a weak intermolecular attraction. It's actually somewhat unlike covalent bonds and ionic bonds, um, and usually it's represented by a dotted line between two components of separate molecules or two regions separate within a molecule. Hydrogen bonds are very important because they play a huge role in the stability of the molecules we'll be dealing with in anatomy and physiology. But individually, they're fairly weak, attractive forces. 
Now, what makes a hydrogen bond possible is when the partial charges that we see across polar bonds interact. Now, the depiction here is of water molecules interacting, which is a very, very common example of where hydrogen bonds come together. Remember that the hydrogen has a partial positive charge and oxygen has a partial negative charge. In fact, it has two partial negative charges opposite the hydrogens. Here we see a hydrogen bond represented by a dotted line, which is commonly how they're depicted in these kinds of pictures, between the partially positive hydrogen and the partially negative oxygen. Hydrogen bonds are found elsewhere, and they're always going to be between partial charges. Now, they're referred to as hydrogen bonds because most often one of the players in the bond is the partially positive hydrogen found in a polar bond with oxygen or maybe nitrogen. Um, so if we have a nitrogen with a hydrogen or an oxygen with a hydrogen in, say, an amino acid, it can hydrogen bond to the partially negative charged component in another molecule or another part of a molecule. And we'll see those quite often. They're very important in how protein structure is maintained and nucleic acid structure. Before leaving the idea of chemical bonding, I want to just jump back real quick to this image that has to do with the idea of the lattice structure of the sodium chloride ionic crystal structure. Um, considering that water molecules are polar, we can see here actually what sorts of interactions we'd expect when an ionic bond meets a water solution. Sodium chloride dissolves because of how the partial charges in the water molecule interact with the charged particles of sodium and chloride. The partial charges of a number of water molecules attracted to sodium is going to be stronger than the charge of chloride being attracted to sodium. So ionic bonds often break apart when they're dis they go into water, which is essentially the basis of dissolving. 